everyone. I'm Jack Kupferman in my new role at Great Panthers NYC as Chief Catalyst Officer. And we've um, transferred the reins of leadership from myself to Michelle Arnaud, who is also on the, the webinar right now. She has many skills that I just don't have. And it's so important that we've been able to create some sort of a, um, a stable organization with succession. As everybody on this call knows, Great Panthers has been in existence since 1970 with the um, amazing leadership of a, the charismatic leader, Maggie Kuhn. And what she had done for the world was highlight the issues of ageism and the power of older people through intergenerational collaboration. Now, we are, this webinar is an official side event of the open-ended working group on aging at the United Nations. So during the intersession between the morning session and the afternoon session, we're doing this webinar. There are other side events that are happening. So this is part of how we're uh, reaching out. What we want, what the purpose of today's webinar is that to go from words to action. There's been so much that's been written and spoken about ageism, but what are the practical ways to com to deal with it and combat it? And what we're hoping is that from these discussions that we, Grey Panthers NYC, can establish one or two projects that will have some sort of a sustainable long-term effect to um, combat ageism and to alleviate some of the invis invis invisibility of older people and work through that on that through intergenerational collaboration and satisfaction. So I think that we're really excited. We are clearly excited for this webinar and what we're what we're doing is that, as many of you know, Great Panthers has um, is a, an accredited NGO at the United Nations, so we have that opportunity to participate. The open-ended working group, which is happening right now at the United Nations, is the um, the initiative to protect the human rights of older people everywhere in the world. The dream of the open-ended working group is that there would be the drafting of a particular of a convention, meaning a global treaty, to protect the human rights of older people, and that would involve the participation of many people throughout the world. A lot of work has already been done by the NGO community and by advocates, and. Now the governments have to be convinced. They are, all governments are aware about aging, but they have not put their nose to the grindstone to say that a convention, meaning a global treaty, is worthy for older people. That's where all of us on this call come in. And this is all because this is one aspect of ageism. Why are older people invisible? Why is it not, not, it doesn't have to be the top priority, but one of the priorities that people actually act on. So I, this is why we have these amazing panelists. We have three fantastic speakers and we're gonna make this whole project, this whole webinar a little different because what we're going to be doing is that each of the individuals will give their presentation and they'll ask questions of each other that should spark, spark your, not only their imaginations, but everybody on the webinar's imagination so that you can understand what's going on and how we can create change. Now, as you may know, Tracy Gendron, who is our, uh, first panelist has written a fantastic book on ageism unmasked. She is the chair of the gerontology department at 
Virginia Commonwealth University. And in her book, she provides examples of not only how ageism affects, um, how, how, how it manifests itself, but also what are potential opportunities to change that course. So we're going to be we're going to have her comments, and we also have Ken Dykewald, who is one of the most significant gerontologists in the United States today, and equally important, he is an, a a gray panther from decades ago. He had been um, one of Maggie's Maggie Kuhn's, I don't know about confidants but had been working with Maggie Kuhn. So he understands Grey Panthers from the beginning to today. And he's always a thoughtful and powerful and for the want of a better word, out of the box. Uh, he's written all, many books and he has his entity, which is called Age Wave. Now, thirdly, we have Jordan Evans. Jordan is one of the co-founders of Art Against Ageism, which by itself is one way to address the concept, the, um, the scourge of ageism through artistic measures, whether they be installations or whatever it may be. So it is that creative juice that helps all of us identify and then um, move forward. And as we're going through, I want all the people who are on this call to think of specific ways or projects that they think that we can address ageism. So I'm going to, um, let me see what, what else do you have here. Now one of, as I had also mentioned, at the, as the open-ended working group, the open-ended working group has had 14 sessions. This is the 14th annual session without the drafting of, of a convention, even a draft convention. It's long overdue for that. And I think that as the people on this call can also reach out to their own individual countries and also to the, whether it's be the social ministries or the foreign ministries to say it's long overdue to protect the rights of older people and encourage them to support the drafting of a, a global convention. As I said, this is time to move forward from the words on ageism to projects to combat ageism. And with that, I'd like to ask Tracy to start us off. Thank you so much, Jack. Hello, everybody. It is just a delight to be here today. And I see so many familiar faces, including some VCU gerontology students. Hello, VCU gerontology students. So happy that you're here. Um, I'm just delighted to be here today to have this conversation with you. I really encourage you to use the chat feature. So if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you have reflections, as I'm speaking, as Ken is speaking, as Jordan is speaking, please feel free to, to put that into the chat and to continue the dialogue um, that way as well. And hopefully we will have time for questions. So I'm gonna start off by doing a little bit of level setting. And I think it's important to do some level setting before we dive into a conversation because people don't really fully understand very often the complexity and the depth of ageism. So I wanna really just start by a, a broad conversation defining what ageism is. And the way that I like to do this is to first start to talk about what aging is. And I find this to be really interesting. So very often when I do a talk about ageism, I will open it up to an audience and say, who in this audience considers themselves to be part of the aging population? And I ask for a show of hands. So people will, you know, yep, raise their hands, but invariably there are people that don't raise their hands. So then I'll say, okay, well, who today is older today than they were yesterday? And that's when we laugh and everybody raises their hand and you go, yes, that's right. We're all part of the aging population, but we misunderstand aging 
in a couple of really important ways. Number one, we think of aging as something that just older people are experiencing. But as I said, there's no such thing as somebody that is not aging. Aging, in fact, is the one universal human experience that we all um, go through every moment of our lives. So to think of aging as older people means that many of us disconnect and disassociate from our own aging and being someone that is older. Okay, so that's the first way we misunderstand aging. The second way that we tend to misunderstand aging is that we're all very familiar with how our bodies change over time. And for good reason, because our bodies do change over time, because we can't often do some of the same things that we do, because there are some universal processes like changes to our eyesight that occur throughout our lifetime. And it's something that we talk about, it's something that we share, and we often equate aging as just a process of decline. But what gerontologists know that a lot of other people may not know is that aging is the complicated process of biological, psychological, social, and spiritual change over time. Aging is not only about decline, aging is also about growth right? It's complex. And while we definitely lose abilities in some ways, we gain abilities and strengths in other ways. So when we see aging as just a process of decline and just in our bodies, we're also missing the greatest gifts that aging brings. And that is that ultimately aging is a process of living, of becoming our unique selves. So when we don't have a full appreciation for what aging is, it's really easy to then fall into the trap of ageism. So what's ageism? Well, ageism has many different layers to it. Ageism happens anytime we make an assumption or a judgment or we stereotype or discriminate against somebody based on their age. Now that means ageism is omnidirectional. It is towards people that are older than us and people that are younger than us. Anytime we see someone and we make an assumption about them, you're too young to understand this. You're too old to understand this. We are falling into the trap of ageism. And it's important that we recognize it as bi-directional because it can create a cycle. Right? If we're discriminating against younger people and then we're potentially feeding their discrimination against older people. When the truth is that age in and of itself is a poor predictor of anything when it comes to looking at an individual person. So age and when we see someone externally focused is a form of ageism. Okay, That's like an other directed ageism. But ageism is also self-directed. So have you ever thought to yourself, I'm too old to learn something new. I'm too old to wear that outfit. I'm too young to be a supervisor, whatever it may be. The way that we feel about ourselves and our age and our own aging is very, very powerful. And that's called self-directed ageism. It's very often the fear and the shame and the dread that we carry around about being or becoming older. And that holds some really, really important consequences for our health and for our happiness and for our longevity. So ageism is towards others. Ageism is also towards ourselves. Ageism also exists in a relational space and in our relationships. So there are often hidden little compliments, and I put compliments in quotes that we give other people that reinforce ageism that reinforce kind of the youth obsessed culture that we live within. So if I haven't seen Ken in 30 years and I say, Ken, oh my God, you haven't aged a bit since I saw you last. And Ken says, thank you so much. That's such a compliment. In our relationship, we have just perpetuated ageism because there's nothing wrong with looking older, being older, acted, acting older, but we're taught that youth is the gold standard. So it's towards others, it's towards ourselves, it's in our relationships, and it's also in our institutions, in our policies, in our laws. It's embedded 
within the fabric and the structure of our society, even like within the bricks of the institutions and the building in which we sit. Let me give you an, an example. Have you ever gone out to a restaurant and you go with a group of friends and you notice that it's really dim lighting? So you're trying to read the menu, but it's really dim. So you can barely see it. And then the font is really small. <laughs> so you really have a hard time seeing it. Then you're trying to have a conversation after you're trying to read the menu and the music is so loud that you're having a hard time hearing other people. That's actually structural ageism and ableism that's built into the environment. When we don't have all the accessible services and the accessible environments that make it easy for people of all ages and abilities to navigate, right? So it's built in within to the structures as well. So ageism is really everywhere. And ageism is kind of multicultural as well. So the research shows at this point that ageism is pretty prevalent in most cultures and countries. However, I think it's important to note that there are some really wonderful examples of specific cultures and communities, several indigenous communities that really do value elders in a different way, that have societies that are designed to celebrate milestones of aging and milestones of later life and achievements of older people. If you look at the book, The Blue Zones, you'll see some of those communities within there about how they are structured. But the research shows that as communities as a whole become more intergenerationally disconnected and more capitalistic, we tend to devalue the contributions of older people. So it really is everywhere and it matters. So why does this matter? And I think this is a really important question for you to ask yourselves. Why does this matter to me? Well, as I said before, it matters to our health, it matters to our happiness, and it matters to our longevity. And if you haven't read the book or the great work of Becca Levy, who is on this call, I highly suggest that you do because she has been the pioneer in this work. She has been the one who has paved the way, Becca, you're awesome, for us to understand the physical and psychological implications of ageism and how the stress and the dread and the fear and the disassociation that we carry with us about being or becoming old actually has really negative health consequences for us and can really damage even how long we live. So there's 20 years or more of research on this that shows those really strong connections. So that's why it matters. But it also matters for business, for technology, for entrepreneurs. It matters because we often design and develop products and services for older people without the input of older people. Making assumptions about what older people want rather than asking them and involving them in the process. So it matters if you're an entrepreneur and you have a business idea, right? We need to think through ageism. It also matters just for equity to create a world where we are building people up and we are providing opportunities for people of all ages to thrive. We want people of all ages to thrive. And to do that, we have to understand what ageism is and we have to dismantle all of the systems that contribute to ageism. So I think it's important for us to think about all of the places that it exists all of the ways in which it can influence us from personally to professionally to within our relationships, and then to find that reason why it matters to you. Because I think that change starts with each individual and that starts with your motivation for why do I wanna think about this differently? Why do I wanna do this differently? And I know that we're gonna get to some examples of things that we can do, but I will stop there so that we can just continue the conversation and hand it over to Ken to share his thoughts. Ken, you're on. I'm on. Uh, big shout out to Paul Nathanson, uh, original secretary of the Great Panthers. Dropped out of a big law firm in order to do good for the public, to have Paul be with us today and to be a, have Paul as a friend for these 50 plus years. Good to have you, my friend. Um, so I'm going to uh, 
share my point of view about all of this. And what I ask you guys to do is all the things you think and speak and write about ageism, I'm going to ask you to just park it for a few minutes because uh, I may have the identical view as you. I may have a different view than you, um, but I'm going to do my best to be share my truth as I see it. Uh, I was fortunate to be a member of the early Grey Panthers. Maggie Kuhn and I were on the road for a lot of years giving speeches. And so uh, there's a lot of people involved with the Grey Panthers today who never met Maggie. And she was uh, she was truly a force to be reckoned with, a warrior. Um, so I and we had one pre phone call, Tracy and Jack and Jordan through email and uh, I couldn't explain what Tracy just did any better than, than Tracy. Tracy is quite brilliant about this subject. So what she and the team has asked me to do is to give a little bit of a historical perspective, which may be something you think about every day, I do, or maybe something you haven't thought about. So first, let me say that um, throughout, let's say, 100,000 years, uh, older people were not discriminated against in a negative way, they were viewed to be the best of us. And um, we were largely agrarian in the way we went about our work, which meant that people worked on farms, usually owned by their parents or grandparents. Uh, the future didn't come along so quickly. And so if somebody had been alive 30 or 50 or 70 years, they would probably understand things somewhat better than a younger person. And also, if you ever hoped to, uh, there was not was not you didn't get paid cash. So if you were ever hoped to have any power or influence or property, you better be nice to grandma and grandpa. And also, as Andy Ackenbaum, who passed away last month, pointed out that um, there was no real understanding of what caused death. You know, there was no germ theory of disease. And so it was generally believed that if you were an elder, if you were an older person, God had selected you. My wife and I and our kids uh, spent some time in Kenya right before COVID, and we spent time with the Maasai people who were extraordinarily interesting and wonderful and kind to us. And the older people there are called elders, and the younger people refer to themselves as junior elders. So they seek to become elders. That's the way that they view life as aging being an ascent, not a descent. So, so that was the case for a long time, for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, and elders had power in their communities. They had the front row seats in the church. The Senate was named after elderhood. If you go to Great Britain today, the barristers and such still wear white wigs to make them appear older. Um, that was a powerful theme, and I don't think anybody imagined it would ever change. Then, oddly, as we appreciate the intersection of demographics, economics, sociology and cultural perspectives, and they do all work together um, and impact each other. And intersectionality is a thing we're going to come back to. They, um, the Industrial Revolution began, and all of a sudden there were jobs to be filled in the cities, not on the farms. And knowing about weather changes and having a spiritual sense of life, was not the key asset to have. It was being young and strong and being able to get work done on an assembly line. And so there, we talk about the digital divide, but there was a labor divide. Younger people moved to cities and they began working in this new economy. And what emerged was the belief that older people were kind of yesterday, young people were tomorrow. And um, it was believed that you know, the Roaring Twenties, if you can picture the Roaring Twenties, the pictures we've all seen, it was the flapper look, it was youth, it was, you know, still racist to the max. But in terms of age, there was the belief that youth was the future of America. And when the 1930s came along, at least in my analysis, uh, I think there's been a romanticization of Social Security. Uh, my, I, I think it was a solid and positive intervention. Um, about a third of the elderly were impoverished then because they were left behind and they didn't have jobs to compete and they weren't earning cash like their children and grandchildren were. Um, so the thought was if we gave them a small stipend, 
let's say a couple $300 a year would keep them out of the poor house. And the equation between the generations, some people say in the first day of Social Security, it's 159 workers to one. But normally when we see 1940, it was 40 workers to one. And so there wasn't much of a strain on young people to support a small number of older people. But I would argue that the more important and perhaps equally important uh, variable was that the unemployment rate during those years was 25%. So the realization was that if we don't get these young people into the workforce, they may never get married. They may never have kids. They may never create a future America. So let's move the old people out. So oddly, Social Security had a certain ageist engine under it um, that we often forget, or maybe I misperceive that, but that's what I've learned and been taught by some of my mentors. Um, and so we began to create a notion that what was good was young, what was not so good was old. And the language changed and the dress changed and the sense of what it is to be an American. And then it changed again. After World War II, which had been preceded by a terrifying depression and then this terrifying war, the boys came home. 92% uh, of all women who could have kids did. They averaged just around four kids each. So we went from a kind of a declining birth rate to an exploding birth rate. It was called the baby boom, not initially, but decades later, my a buddy of mine, Landon Jones, gave it its nickname, the baby boom. <clears throat> And I want to point out something else that many pe people don't appreciate, that when the war ended, there were 8,000 television sets in America. Wow. So up until that point, most marketing and advertising was done in papers or is done on the radio. And it was not oriented towards young people because they didn't read papers or listen to the radio like their parents did. But all of a sudden, TV came along and the kids would watch. And many advertisers began to realize, and there was a notion that you might not think underpins modern ageism, but having worked half of my career in the not-for-profit sector and half in the for-profit sector, I kind of learned things from both sides. Doesn't mean I'm right, but this is the way my mind, mind goes. There was this notion of lifetime brand loyalty. And at that moment in time, the 1950s and 60s, when TV came alive and advertising came alive, um, there was the notion that if you could capture people towards your brand when they were in their teens or early 20s, you'd have them for life. But why bother with 50 and 60 year olds? Because they already were set in their ways. They knew what toothpaste they were going to use or they or they you know, knew what kind of car they were going to drive. And also, since that was a generation grew up in the shadow of the Depression, they were not attractive consumers. They were very frugal. So what emerged was kind of a crazy youth obsession where you know even to this day if you read the analysis of tv watching it'll say the viewership was x but among the sought after youth demographic the viewership was y and i think my god that still exists today even though today 50 and 60 and 70 year olds are trying new things and reinventing themselves and are you know, sporting new ideas and attitudes and are the boomers. So have lived a life of perhaps non-frugality and maybe excessive consumption, which is going to trouble them in the years to come because they won't have enough money saved. And also the demography flips because we have a lot of people growing older and we've had declining birth rates. And so you've got this sort of seesaw where older people, there's more and more of us and there's fewer and fewer people to bake into that equation. Um, what's emerged in our lifetime is the belief that young people are cool, they're attractive, we like the way their bodies look, um, they're game to exploring new technologies, new products, new services, new identities. Older people, the opposite, not so much not particularly appealing, not particularly interesting, not particularly open-minded, kind of set in their ways, even though that may be all false. Fourth, from where I sit, having, this is my 51st year working in the field of aging. And by the way, when Bob Butler came along and in 1968 conjured up the word ageism, and he was a pediatric psychiatrist. He was not a geriatrician, but he in many ways created the modern field of geriatrics. And Bob 
uh, told me and many others of us in the beginning of the field that there will clearly be gerontologists that will come along that are well schooled, well credentialed, and really know the business, you know, the business of gerontology. And Tracy may very well be our kind of the top of that food chain. But he said, let's define gerontology as a hybrid field. So social workers and urban planners and psychologists can, like yourself and others, can think of themselves as working in, in the field of gerontology. But Bob created this psychiatric disorder called gerontophobia, called it a psychiatric disorder. And as exactly as Tracy just characterized, it was a discomfort with the aging process, a discomfort with older people, and a discomfort with one's own growing older. And um, I'm not sure that that's gone away. So what we see now, though, is something quite different, which is we see uh, a demographic shift, what I called an age wave. Um, we see, you know, Tom Cruise did his stunts for Top Gun, and he was 59. And when my wife and I went to see that movie, we looked it up, and when Cocoon was made, Wilford Brimley, the little old man who started that movie, he was 49 years old. You know, there's, you know, the Rolling Stones back out on tour. I saw Springsteen last month and he's 74 my age and he rocked the place. And, you know, Martha Stewart lands on the cover of Sports Illustrated at 81. Gail King this month at 69. Oprah 70 and telling people she has no intention of going to the sidelines. And so we see this more my wife got interviewed the other day and they said, oh, Maddie Dykewell believes in growing old gracefully. And she said, no. And Maggie didn't buy the growing old gracefully thing. She thought you should grow old rebelliously, outrageously, with verve, with force, with intention, and with wisdom. She liked the word elder, not so much the word elderly, but elder. Um, she challenged me one night, we were speaking at a conference, to come up, up with a word to replace long-term care and geriatric medicine, using the word elder. And she said, do that by breakfast. So I picked her up at breakfast and I said, elder care. She said, I like it. And I wrote two books about elder care and that's become popular. When Chip Conley wrote his book, Making of a Modern Elder, you know, Wisdom and Work, his publisher didn't want the word elder in the title. Uh, so there's, we're still living in a time where even though there's more gravitas, people over 50 now control 70% of all the wealth in most modernized nations. Uh, China had a life expectancy of 45 in 1950. It's now, it's now higher than the United States. By the way, I'll make a comment about that. Ageism, ageism is pernicious in how we constructed our healthcare system. We are there are 39 countries in the world that live longer than we do in the United States. Excuse me? How is that acceptable? And we are 68th worldwide with regard to our health spans. So for all the money we spend, we're creating a, 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 an ill, chronic, degenerative, hurting, suffering version of aging. And to me, that's just like, I mean, how can I look myself in the mirror and tolerate that? Um, so ageism is not just about a bad ad or a bad piece of language. It's about a systemic uh, disregard or exploitation of older people. Last point I want to make is I think that we still have a modern version of ageism that we're grappling with here. And thank you, Jack, for inviting us to share some thoughts about it. Uh, what I see, particularly in the world of marketing, communications, and media, is that older people are still portrayed as buffoonish. You know, we see these absurd examples of older people and somebody must think that's funny. You know, if you replace it with women or people of African-Americans or Asian-Americans, you wouldn't tolerate it. Older people are often viewed as broken. And that's because the pharmaceutical industry and the medical device world is, you know, dominates the news hours. And all you see is if you're 30 years old, you see older people are falling down. They can't get up or they can't hear, or their skin is not right, or they can't go to the bathroom, or they go too often, or, or it's just like, it's insane. Uh, or you see older people viewed as supernatural. Years ago, there was a guy that water skied with a rope between his teeth. And, you know, you see examples of older people doing these extraordinary things, and somebody must think those are good role models, but they're not real. 
And another version is older people are homogeneous. They're not. We grow more individualized as we age, whether that's sexually or financially or style-wise or how we wear our hair or what we want to drive. We are not a group and last. We're often left out. And I particularly take note of that around Valentine's Day. Uh, when all the ads are about love and romance, and there's usually no one over 50 in any of them. I want to add one last piece before I hand it over to, to Jordan, what? that there are also what I would call favorable examples of ageism, which people don't seem to ever want to talk about. So you reach a certain age, and whether you need it or not, you get discounts on stuff. Hmm. And when was that age set? Now, I was involved with AARP when you had to be 65 years old to join. It was the American Association of Retired Persons. And then they dropped it to 60 and then to 55 and then to 50. And it wasn't because people were getting old younger. It was because they wanted more consumers and more clients and more customers and more money. People get safety nets, which I think are fabulous and saved people's lives, particularly during COVID. But if you're 58 years old and you're working two jobs and you've got two kids and one of them is a special needs child and you don't get medical benefits, but everybody over 65 does, that's ageism. Agreed. Agreed. And last, I'll say that um, the ages to which we key these benefits is a manifestation of ageism. If I'm out in front of audiences, and I've been my whole life, and I ask people, what age do you think people grow old today? Most people, especially older people, raise their hands at between 80 and 85. And I say, I suppose you won't mind not getting your old age-related benefits until you're 80 or 85, and I always get booed. Yeah, of course. So if we're going to play around with ageism, we can't just do the, that's, a, that's an ageist negative. We also have to Think about the effect on younger generations and on all of us if we've got the wrong ages and the wrong identity issues and the wrong purpose. So let me be quiet for now. Um, Thank you, Ken. You know, that all, all of that just makes me think. So, you know, the, the, the spark to make everything happen or to at least stimulate the brain cells for all of us is really very important and for everyone here. It may be a different perspective on ageism, but I would like to uh, go over to Jordan and looking forward to hearing your comments. Yeah, um, I I am super, let me just first off and say, I'm super privileged to be with these panel experts and um, I had to take my pad and pen out because Tracy, I loved the lesson you just taught and Ken, the history lesson on U.S. Uh, politics and just like societal changes and ageism has really been helpful. Um, and I'm really curious, I did drop this in the chat, but I'm curious for people outside of the U.S. hearing Ken's um, timeline and just the societal significance that happened in the U.S. And uh, I'm curious how your country can relate or even how you're like, oh, that happened here or there's this thing that happened here or there's this legislation that happened here. I'm really curious how that how this a us is, is also translates in other countries so um also jack i'm going to push back on something that you said and i'm going to say i believe that creativity and art is the only way to combat ageism and i'll tell you why um <clears throat> i want to point out something that you said tracy um ageism is assumptions and judgments, and all of that is illogical. No one logically, and people use like stats and generalizations and broad brushes to say, well, you know, well, when you're this old, when you're young, you don't have any experience. Well, experience is broad and there's no way to define experience. Or when you're older, you're, you, your body tends to, to just get older and you just can't do certain things. Well, different people age differently it's not you know you, it's not logical so how do you fight this nonsense with logic uh there's a thing i learned working with uh, my co-founder and i worked with the center for artistic activism and they asked us a question of what made you step off the curb and i ask other people this often and everyone on this 
on this webinar is in some way interested in combating ageism or you wouldn't have joined. Um, and so what made you step off the curb? And I, nine times out of 10, it was not reading a list of facts about how ageism affects people. It was not reading a petition and saying, oh, well, 100 people signed this petition, so I now care about ageism. It is something that happened to you. It's called a movement for a reason because it moved you. Um, and so I was, as, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking about these, these two kind of entities. Is the, you have the choir and the convert. And so often in our approaches to combating ageism, we try to be the choir. So we're singing the hymnals and we're and we're just like, you know, reciting the stuff that we're told. And we're teaching, we're preaching to the choir, but the person that we're talking to has not been converted yet. And so they're just, all the facts and stuff is going in one ear out the other, but it's important. It's important to have the facts. It's important because that is how you get listened to. But we have to convert people first. So we have to, I mean, combating ageism in anything that we do and anything we come up with today has to have two parts. It has to convert a person and then light a fire in their belly for it. You have to convert them, but you can go to church, you can go to a religious thing and not join the choir. So there's something that, that turns your mind to say, okay, ageism is a problem. And it's something that has to happen from the heart to get to the head. And then we need to have them read all the stuff and go to things like this and go to the retreats and talk to the webinars and talk to the experts so that they can start to start to sing, start to sing the good, the good word. Um, I am I was raised a Baptist, so that is like. I, I think about singing the good word and just being being so loud. And that's what I imagine the after the convert. You 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 get the choir. Um, so I'm gonna take a step back and talk about what we do at artistic uh, with artistic activism at Art Against Ageism. We use artistic activism to challenge these ideas around age beliefs and or to around stereotypes around aging and to promote positive age beliefs. We added promoting positive age beliefs to our mission after reading Becca Levy's book. And I realized that Becca Levy came, or Dr. Becca Levy came to be a silent observer and in the audience and yet has been mentioned and pulled out so many times. So you don't have to say anything. Um, I would have referenced you if you were here or not. So um, we, so age beliefs, if you haven't gotten a chance to understand and read about it, I'm not even going to go into explaining, but I'm just going to say, if you read Breaking the Age Code, you learn that age beliefs, be it positive or negative, can have a 7.5 year effect on your life. So we found it important, um, and please correct me if on anything I said was wrong, um, we find it very important to combat not only stereotypes around aging, but also not just to combat it, but also to promote those positive age beliefs. Um, no movement throughout history, no movement has ever been successful without creativity. And I'll give you an example. Um, one of my favorite examples is two from the civil rights movement. Um, it is Rosa Parks sitting on the bus and the march on Selma. Um, Rosa Parks, everyone knows the picture of Rosa Parks on the bus. It's a famous photo, but you may not know that it was a staged photo. So she was reluctant to do it. After it happened to her, a bunch of activists came to her and said, hey, we would like you to stage this so that we can share what you experienced with the, with the world. And she didn't want to do it, but she agreed. And actually the guy sitting behind her was a reporter for the Associated Press. Um, and so that stage photo became a poster for the movement. And the second example is the March on Selma. And this is really a bit more strategic and in, in, in creative in the approach. Um, the day they chose, the city they chose was all purposeful. Um, the, I think it was the sheriff, James Clark or Jim Clark, was a huge segregationist and hated, just just hated people of color. And the governor, 
um, George Wallace was also not a big, he was a segregationist and he did not want to support. So they chose that city because they knew that 600 protesters would not be protected and would be obliterated by the state troopers. And that's what happened. And so they knew that would happen. So they had news reporters there and they made sure that this was seen all across the U.S. And if they had not been purposeful in making sure that there was coverage for this to effectively move people, they would not have an effective movement. And so whatever approach that we come up with in combating ageism must be affective as well as effective, because even the most effective plan, if it does not move people, will not be a movement. Um, and so lastly, one thing that I do want to talk about is just in the messiness that is combating ageism, I feel like we constantly, to, as someone who is 27, and I am 27 now, I was born in 1997 in January, so I just turned 27. Um, I'm so tired and feeling, a feeling alone, but yet also just like feeling outside of the segmented conversations about older adults, because yes, older adults experience ageism, and the ageism that older adults feel or experience, feel, experience, negatively affects them so different than young adults. I mean, older adults can can die because of the experience of ageism that they experience, but everyone experiences ageism. And so if we wanna be a real movement, we have to include everyone so that younger people are protecting their older self and investing in a society that promotes them to age well. And then we also are doing well for older adults and, and creating a society that they can be, they can age in now. And so I think it's important that we talk about ageism as everyone's experiences in order to really move outside of our own circle. Because I feel like so often when I talk to people about ageism, they question if it's even a word. I don't know if anyone else has ever heard that, but they're like, that's not a word. That's that's just something you made up. And it and so it needs to be something on a I, I'll give you a last example. And this is something that has recently like disgusted me. Um names aren't important, and I don't really find this person important enough to reach mention their name, but one of the stars of the new um Mean Girls movie was recently on Andy Cohen's Watch What Happens Live. There's a show on Bravo. And when asked about another person, she openly on public on, on a public forum on, on a show said, oh, I like them and I'm typically ageist. So I'm really shocked that I like them. The movie was not canceled. I heard a few grumblings within our circle, but nothing happened. And so uh, there, there needs to be a larger conversation about ageism and it needs to happen not in these circles but also in a media um, campaign and a commercial campaign and it makes me think about um, Hillary Duff's commercial about don't say gay I don't know if anyone remembers that but that was huge and I remember saying it made me and others stop saying gay as a thing to reference things that suck and it it effectively moved us. So like, oh, if Hillary Duff is talking about it. And maybe like, maybe we should rethink doing this. Um, I think we need to do, we need to be head and heart practitioners as well as organizational, systemic and structural practitioners. Um, the, the, the policy work is important. Setting boundaries around people's behaviors is how society works. And we have to do that. We have to say, we won't tolerate this within our organizations. We set policies to say, we won't tolerate this. We have to have organizational, structural, and systemic practitioners to come in and build policies on an individual level and society level to say, this is how we, this is how we expect you to behave. But we also need head and heart practitioners to effectively move people to not only just govern themselves accordingly, 
but also to expect others to, to govern themselves as well. And not because we've been told to, but because it's right. J Jordan, generally on webinars, I, I'm so engaged with what all you guys have been saying, but I also think that we have another important component of this webinar. I would like each one of you, each one of the um, panelists to ask each other questions that they can answer. So uh, let's start with you, Tracy, to ask any of the uh, panelists the questions that you may have for them so that we as a group can learn more. Sure. There's a lot of great questions and I'll, I'll throw one out. Jordan, I'll start with you um, and throw this out, but then I'd, I'd love to hear everybody's kind of take on this. As a, as a movement, where the anti-ageism movement is right now, what do you think we're doing right and what do you think we're doing wrong? Where do you think that we can can pivot and where do we need to expand? Great question. I think that we need to stop using monoliths and stop talking about what boomers think and what um, Gen Z and, and, and stop just putting people in, in cages and start understanding that age is a individual experience, just like race is an individual experience and just like religion. And, and just really, if we really want to be a part of the larger movements to just treat people equally and equitably, um, I think we need to start talking about us um, and so not, you know, well, boomers tend to do this. And, and and I think it's important to understand that people have shared experiences. But even in those shared experiences, I'm a Gen Zer and I don't relate to the the quote unquote stereotypes of Gen Zers. I do experience like, you know, we've all experienced. I grew up with the Internet. Yes. But I think that when we use that, when we put so much importance in those shared experiences, we lose sight of the individual. So, can I say something about that? Jack, do you mind if I jump in? Please. So I, I love that answer and, and thank you for answering it that way. I wanna say a little something about these generations and the way that we use them because I see generational labels as a form of ageism and I'll tell you why. If you've ever seen like an identity wheel, right? Identity wheel has a person on the inside and then it has different layers of all the different forms of people's identities, from ones that they're born with, race, gender, to ones that we choose over time, age and ability and socioeconomic status and language and you know where we grew up and all of those things all shape who we are, right, really individually. And we know that when it comes to aging, although aging is a universal thing that we all have in common, no two people age in the same way because of all of those identities and all of those individual experiences we have. So knowing that, and that's quite logical, I don't understand how we can then assume that people born within a 15 or 20 year span have the same likes and dislikes, the same traits, the same personalities, it makes no sense. So when we call someone a boomer or we call someone a Gen Xer or a millennial or whatever, what are we actually saying? It's yet another label that we are putting on them that does not describe the individual and does not even represent or acknowledge their various forms of identities. So I think we need to be really careful with these generational labels and understand how they contribute to ageism. So thank you for bringing that up. Ken, did you wanna answer the question as well? Sure, I'll do a quick shot at it. Um, I vaguely remember from my college days learning about how the mind had a hard time holding a negative. So if I say you don't think of big white elephants, I know what you all just thought of. So I feel like the anti-ageism field has been a lot about putting down something that somebody thinks is ageist, but you don't necessarily know what, what, the, what the better version is. So I think the field has got to be more constructive. And this is a positive example of aging well, or this is an elder who, you know, for example, for me, the most extraordinary person I've ever met was Nelson Mandela. 
the fact that he was 80 at the time added to how extraordinary he was. It didn't diminish him. It made him more amazing. And so rather than just bet on you for being ageist, I think, okay, fine. That, and then what are some of the examples and the what's the pathway? Leonard Hayflick taught me that throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectancy was under 18. And two thirds of all the people who've ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. So this is a new frontier. It's not as though we've had hundreds of years to figure this out. This is now. And we, Jack and team, and those of us who've joined this call, we are the pathfinders. And there will be mistakes made, and some of them will be ill-intended, some of them will be ignorant. And I think what we have to do is to show people what the world could be. And, you know, that's to me what was so extraordinary about the Martin Luther King speech. It was about having a dream. And so, so that's my answer to your question, Tracy. I think two things. We focus a lot on that ageism is bad, but we don't do enough showing what's the world that we'd like to shape more of. And the second point I want to make is that there's a lot of opinionated individuals, and I'm one of those, who we write books, we give speeches, we make money, we get TED Talks, and our identity is caught up in something versus, you know, joining hands and insisting on certain things. You know, I was with Maggie. We did a presentation where the Black Balloon Collection had just been launched by Hallmark. And Maggie invited the head of marketing for Hallmark to come to the conference. And she went up to him, you know, with her little arthritic hands. And she said, you better stop that and stop it today. It's wrong. And Hallmark shut down that line of cards the following Monday. And so I think that a certain degree of being a warrior is necessary. There are bad things going on. And to say, hey, that's your choice and freedom of speech. Jordan said it, there's right and wrong. And not only does this wrong hurt other people and hurt people's prospects for their future, but it hurts your own future, which is the irony of it. It's like a bad science fiction story. What about you, Tracy? What would you say the field needs to do different? I think that um, I think that that you both, you and Jordan both referred to this. I think this is a great start in having conversation with people that choose to be here. Uh, but we need to break through that and talk to other people that, that don't have the same level of awareness or interest in this. So it's time to break out of the gerontology, as, as Ashton calls it, age land community and get into other spaces where we can really introduce this. I also think we need to start doing a better job of looking at the intersections of ageism with other forms of discrimination. Um, Wait. That can risk and disadvantage, and how all of those kind of stack up over time to put people even more at risk. So I think that's another direction. And then finally, I'll say the intersection of ageism and ableism is something that is very, very important to me, something I have started to research. And yet another layer of ageism um, that we need to figure out is kind of fear of dependency and fear of, you know, the physical changes to our bodies and disability. Let me add that, and Jordan, you may or may not know this, that for me, as I've been asked for decades now, sitting in front of people in the White House or presidents of companies or see world leaders, they often say to me, when you look out at the future, what terrifies you the most? And frankly, uh, the answer that I've come to is dementia, uh, which is a disease that preys on the older individual. And Rosa Parks, for example, died with Alzheimer's disease, which you may not know. Um, Jimmy Stewart, Alzheimer's disease. I was with Reagan on his 79th birthday and he clearly was running the country in his last year with Alzheimer's. And so there are entire disease conditions that we don't invest in enough or we don't try to do away with because it's old people having them. And that to me is just horrible. All this Maggie, by the way, would have chained herself to the White House. She got on the Johnny Carson show. She got on Saturday Night Live. She, you know, Jack has got all sorts of wonderful dreams about creating organizations and institutions and initiatives, which are fabulous. But I never really was aware of that much of a great Panther administration. But there was a woman at the helm who was willing to put her own well-being and circumstance at risk 
in order to call attention to things. Ken, I appreciate the insight that you've definitely given us on your decades of experience in, in combating ageism. And so I want to ask the question um, to both of you, um, where do you see the anti-ageism movement in five years? Like, where, where do you see in five years, where will the fight be? Who will be fighting? Lucy? Yeah. Um, I have big hopes, Jordan. I have big, big hopes. And I'm going to go with a big, bright, optimistic picture of five years from now, which is that we've made progress in this space, that you're going to see more organizations and companies that have embed ageism and ableism discussions and training into the existing DEI work that they do, that we are going to start to see some more of those global campaigns that they do have in some countries like Australia and the EU, and the EU UK um, have campaigns against ageism, and we're going to start to see those gain more traction. And we're going to see people that are going to recognize not only the value of all people, but really the fact that we're in the midst of this demographic shift that is happening where we're going to have millions more older people than we ever did, fewer younger people than we ever did. It's going to change the economy. It's going to change the landscape. And instead of seeing that as a tsunami and a natural disaster, is going to see that for the huge opportunity that it is. So in five years, I see us having a, a new conversation, not this one, because we'll have all gotten this by then, right? So we'll be taking it to the next place of how can we elevate it even further. What I'd like to also do now is what other questions that either Jordan or Ken, do you have for the others? Well, I, I'd like Ken to um, get a chance to answer the five-year question. Um, Ken? Yeah, I um, here's what worries me. And again, I don't know if I'm right, but um, first of all, as Tracy points out, there'll just be so many more 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds that that's just the way it works. You know, I would point out that before the boomers became teenagers, teenage life was considered the most miserable stage of life. You know, catcher in the ride, Holden Caulfield, you know, rebel without a cause. You know, you're kind of caught between childhood and adulthood, living in your parents' house, no way to act out on your sexual frustrations. You had no money. And then Pepsi came along and branded youth as, the you know, for those who think young, it became desirable. I think more and more you're going to see 15, and 16, and 7 year olds standing up to be counted and, you know, being proud of their age. And some of that, some of what we have seen will go away. But I would tell you that what worries me are the equations. You know, I think younger people will increasingly feel we're having, you know, and if you look at all the mental health challenges, they're more concentrated among younger people than older people right now. If you look at who votes, more concentrated among older people. So I think younger people will increasingly start to ask themselves, why are we giving up such a big chunk of our lives to support older people who aren't even old yet? And the pressure on us is extreme. And there will be some resentment, you know, some frictions between the generations. And I think that's something we ought to be proactive about and preventative about. And I would also say that, unfortunately, there's also a race diagonal that if you're over 75 in America right now, 80 percent white. It's always been 80 percent white. Your teachers were white. Your coaches were white. Your movie stars were white. But if you go down to the younger generations, it's a minority majority. And so what you might see happening, and I think you're already seeing it happen, is that younger people will feel that these older people don't care about them. They don't care about college tuition. They don't care about mental health problems. They don't care about the cost of raising children, $250,000 a child. Last night, there was a big piece in the media about having childcare is more expensive than mortgage. So what older people are paying attention to or they're by the way i don't think that was what the great panthers was set up for to get more benefits and protections for older people i think it was euthanasia in action and it was about you know being watchdogs for all the things that were not right or not moral or not fair and so i'm concerned about the younger generation thinking that older people present a a heavy weight so uh, what i'd like to do is that we're coming to the end of our um opportunity here I've been completely fascinated by what everybody has been saying. And I'd like to also suggest for every single person 
<laughs> on this webinar. What would you like to do? What, how do you wish to combat ageism? Where are the opportunities? Where, where would you like to participate? I'm hoping that all of you will say that you want to help us, meaning Great Panthers, figure out the projects so that we can make some sort of a substantial dent. Um, more than following this webinar, you'll be getting a short survey that I'm hoping that everybody on the call will be able to respond to. And from that, we'll be able to identify particular projects and to work as an initiative. Um, so I'm really grateful for everybody's comments and the participation. And I know that a lot of people on this call have lots of thoughts. So I don't know that we're gonna have the, the much time for questions, but if we have one or two questions, somebody can raise their hand. I have a question of you, Jack. Okay. What, what's what's the dream that you'd like to see happen? What I'd like to see happen is that the big dream is a societal shift so that it's looking at ageism as an issue of not looking at people's real, real abilities as opposed to the perception of their abilities. And for me, that works both ways. There, one of the things that I had been working in um, city government all my career. And I would hear sometimes people, I, I want a, a legit, I want people to legitimately talk about their ageist uh, experiences. Sometimes they use ageism as an excuse. And many people who have suffered because of their age and their perception don't acknowledge it. For instance, um, in employment opportunities, I would get many people coming in. I was discriminated against because of my age. The reality is you didn't have the skills. On the other hand, there's the, happens so often, people are dismissed because they say, oh, this person doesn't look, have that physical look, and yet they are more powerful and more likely to be, um, effective that somebody that fits that physical profile. Um, and I've seen that hundreds of, hundreds of times. Older people are resources, not burdens. One of the other things that we also need to address is the similarity between the various age cohorts. The things that older people find to be difficult are the same things that younger people find to be difficult. And yet there's like the stupidity of the of the competition. So um, one of the things that we do a, in a, a small way is that including our, you know, those who participate in Great Panthers who are younger, they, the constant thing that happens is the education. And inevitably, they go, I never knew this was so important. Never knew. No, how come nobody has ever told us or even suggested it? You, you had referenced something about um, the definition of ageism and does it really exist? That's kind of what the, the people who are younger even say to, to us. And yet, once they figure out their, their jaws drop open, and they also are able to relate it to themselves. From that, some of the people, the younger people who we have um, had the privilege to work with have become the advocates. They stop people in mid-conversation. That's an ageist comment, or why did you say that? How is that relevant? Those are just some of the things that come out in terms of what I have experienced. So um, we are kind of at the end of our time. Um, I'm trying to, I haven't even opened up to see if there are questions in here. Uh, and somebody just wrote in about appropriate language. That's another thing for me. 
we spend so much time on what is the appropriate word and words are important. Yet it gets tiresome because one of the things that, that happens is that the, the concept of the, the language used for age has changed over the decades, whether it was golden or silver or mature or um, older Seems. or aging or elderly or whatever it is. I'm just tired of hearing all that. Let us figure out if, if it's possible, or is it just a waste of people just wanting to talk about stuff? I'm never sure about that. Hey, Jack, can I suggest just a, a final thing everyone can do before we leave that I, I find empowering? I think that one of the things that we can do to address ageism that is simple and yet really uncomfortable all at the same time goes back to what Jordan was saying about the heart and the head. So as you're all leaving today, what I encourage you to do is embrace your age. Own where you are right this moment. Put it in the chat, say it out loud. I am 53 years old and I am proud to be 53 years old because this is what it looks like for me. Whatever age you are right now, take it, own it, be proud of it. You've worked really hard to achieve it. And if we would all do that instead of covering up our age, it's one simple step that we are taking to empower everybody, everybody to embrace who they are. And what you were saying is that that was Maggie Kuhn's mantra. Own your age. Own your age. Yeah, I, would yeah. to it, I would add to it that telling people they're wrong is a certain righteousness in that, but explaining to people why they might want to think about it in a more respectful way, I think gets gets some effect. So every time you hear a friend or a colleague or a workmate or a relative do the, gee, you're looking so young, or gee, those old people, you might stop and say, let's take a moment on that and try to convert every day. We have a uh, art installation that we bring to events and it's an own your age booth. It's a photo booth where people get the chance to take a photo with their own age. And we, uh, it's on a piece of paper. Thanks for mentioning that, Tracy. It made me think, oh yeah, I have to mention that. Um, we can have it at any event. Um, it's just a photo booth with a backdrop, but we encourage people to own their age. And so with that, we we want people to confront their own internal ageism because as Tracy said, you have buck stops that starts with you. Yep. And I think, you know, as people have been um, on this webinar, there's such a, an incredibly rich, set of comments in the chat we will be we've recorded this we will be sending this out uh after it's been um massaged a little and you'll be getting a um, a survey i'm really so grateful that we've been able to have this talk about a rich conversation um and it is kind of edgy and i don't know if this is the kind of conversation that's normally up about ageism but sure damn good <laughs> powerful thank so, you for having us Jack thank you Jack for inviting us thank you everyone thank you everyone for joining and where is Uma who's 92 oh Una Una, Una, Una Tapper Una, Una, that's what I meant to say yeah bravo Una I haven't spoken to you in quite some time but in any event guys I think that we've concluded our time and thank you so much to all of our presenters and to all of our participants. Awesome job. A lot to, to think about and we'll be doing from this is the spark of a new initiative for Great Panthers. Thank you. All right, guys.